So CBPR, for community-based research, we always quote Israel. She's like the guru of CBPR. And according to her, the definition of CBPR is that we want to increase the knowledge and understanding of a phenomenon, and we want to integrate that knowledge gain with interventions and policy changes that improve the health as well as the quality of life of community members. And basically what that means is we don't want knowledge just for the sake of knowledge. We want to improve people's health. And we believe that the way to do that is to really sit with them and understand from their perspective what's affecting them and how best to address it. So how many students do I have out here? Good, good, good. So we know traditional research. So this slide is a comparison of traditional methods compared to CBPR. So for the traditionalists, um, we pretty much are data driven and we determine what we're going to see based on the funding opportunities. <laughs> but for CBPR, we sit with the community and they tell us what's affecting the health of their loved ones, their families, their communities. For traditional research, we have a budget uh, that drives our implementation, we have scientific rigor, and we have those same things with CBPR, but the community is involved with the process of that study design. Um, they kind of guide us towards the funding direction that we should seek. They guide us in the recruitment and retention. We do use psychometrically sound tools, but the community helps us interpret them. Sometimes we have to change the, the wording. Uh, for instance, there's a fiscal activity tool that we use, and this one talks about a pram, about do you walk your child with a pram? Does anyone here? know what pram is? <laughs> Does anyone refer to their carriage as a pram? No. So those are the kind of things that the community helps us with in changing those psychometrically sound instruments uh, to fit their needs. The design of the intervention. Uh, the community guides us in how to design it, um, how to approach it in a way that's acceptable to that community. And yes, we use statistics to analyze our results, but then we go back to the community and they help us with that discussion of how we use the, the analysis to benefit that population. And before we publish, we share the manuscript with them to make sure that what we're saying really reflects their understanding of the processes and the results of that project. So there are some principles, and again, this is driven by the work of Israel. So the unit of identity, now that unit of identity could be a family, it could be a church, it could be a neighborhood. It's whatever they define their identity as. The principles build on the strengths of that community. So as scientists, we know our strengths um, lie in looking at data. It lies in having resources within the academic setting. But the community also has strengths. One of the strengths that they have may be community health workers. These individuals are very familiar with that community. And they're often going to go the extra mile that our research team may not be able to go. It's very collaborative and it's equitable. And what that means is they are part of every decision and the budget also reflects their input. So we just don't pay the scientists on our research team. We pay those community health workers and we pay for the space that we use in those community settings. It's co-learning. We don't come in as the experts. We know everything. We know the data, yes, but they know how it impacts that community on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's co-learning. They build our capacity as well as we build theirs. 
And whatever we present to them, it has to have local relevance. Because we may know that cancer is the number one killer or heart disease is the number one killer, but what does that mean to them? We could develop a beautiful intervention on cancer or on cardiovascular disease, but if they're interested in violence <coughs> or opioids, then they're probably not going to come to our intervention. And it's iterative. It is back and forth. We listen to them, they listen to us, and we go back and forth until we develop something that's suitable for them. And then with dissemination, they're part of the dissemination plan. And when we start the intervention, we think about how we're going to sustain it once the funding ends. Because a lot of times with the populations that we work with, who oftentimes are marginalized populations, they are accustomed to scientists parachuting in, getting their data, and leaving. So we try to build in that sustainability factor from the beginning. One way that I've found to be the best way to really approach a community is trying to develop a community advisory board. And that board is comprised of individuals who understand that community, who oftentimes live and work or worship within that community. They are somewhat of gatekeepers, and their role is to help us develop the intervention. They help identify people who should be our collaborators or partners in the program, and pretty much they are the first people that we go to when we have an idea or we go to to help understand what the priority needs of a community are. So this is just a little test. With, com with community-based research, it's so very important that we have an understanding of that community before we go in. So a lot of my work has been done in African-American churches. So I'm in church, and this young lady comes up to the podium. She has her church hat, and she has the shoes to match and the suit to match the hat. And she goes to the podium. So I need a volunteer to tell me what, she, what she's going to say when she comes to that podium. First giving on for God is the head of my life. To pastor, first lady, deacons, members, and friends. Um, I'd like to say let me in the house of the Lord one more time because he brought me from a mighty, uh, a mighty long way. I could have been dancing in my bed, but God is the head of me. It's good. Good all the time. Time and all time, God's good. Yes, he is. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have to say that after, after that's said, yes. God is good. All the time, and all the time, God is good. You have to come back with, yes, he is. <laughs> okay. He's a bridge over troubled waters. He's a mother to the loveless and the father to the fatherless, a doctor in the sick room, and a judge in the courtroom. He's the lily of the valley, a bright morning star. He got up early one Sunday morning with all power, glory, power in his hand. Good job. <laughs> that we work with, and that can be a challenge that we'll talk about a, a little bit later, <laughs> but thank you. Community health workers, since I've started CBPR, I don't think I've ever done a project without uh, involving community health workers. And the beauty of them is that the problem that we're trying to address in that community, community health workers often have faced that same problem. They understand the challenge of accessing care. They understand the challenge of going to the clinician and not understanding what's being said. They understand what it is to be marginalized. And they use words that the community that we're trying to reach uses. So I consider them to be essential partners in all of the work that our team does. And then there's the leadership because if we're working with the church, we're not just going to go in and start conducting research. We have to first get through that pastor. And I included my friend here from the office because 
a lot of times those pastors or administrators that we're trying to work with, they have a different perspective of what we're trying to gain from our research. So we have to get to know them. And a lot of times we have to adapt our approach based on the personality of that pastor. But we can't move forward without their endorsement and their support. Otherwise, our intervention will definitely fail. So here are some examples of a few projects that I've done. And we'll start with one called Fit Body and Soul. So back in maybe 2010-ish, um, for the first time, we learned that if individuals could lose 7% of their body weight, that they could delay the onset of diabetes. And that was a clinical trial. It was done across 27 health centers across the nation, led by the University of Pittsburgh, and called the Diabetes Prevention Program. But it was very clinically based. It was very resource intensive. It was delivered by uh, clinicians and trained interventionists who were clinicians. So what we did is we met with the Community Advisory Board in Georgia, and we asked them what's affecting the health of the community. And there were some pastors there, <laughs> and what they told us was no surprise that it was obesity, diabetes, and sedentary behavior. So what we did is we took that clinically based diabetes prevention program that was very prescriptive. Pretty much it said uh, you should walk 150 minutes a week. Um, you should decrease your fat intake to X amount of grams per week. And we integrated motivational interviewing concepts into the diabetes prevention program. <coughs> and we then sat down with the community and we revised it to use the words that the church people use. A word such as, there was a, a part of it that talked about having a contract. But within the church, they used the word covenant. So we changed the word contract to covenant. Within the curriculum, it said that when you're rewarding yourself, you should um, have sex. So the pastor said, well, add <laughs> with your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of, of community input we had. We included images of African American women that reflected the images of the congregations that we were working with. So then we did a pilot program. Um, we trained community health workers, two community health workers from within the church to deliver uh, the intervention over 12 weeks. And the results were excellent. It showed that it was feasible, that the community was excited about the intervention. And meanwhile, we were writing our R18 uh, from the NIDDK. We were funded. So then we had to develop, based on the input from the community, that they were very uncomfortable with the randomized controlled trial. Because they didn't want 10 churches to receive Fit Body and Soul, the Culturally Adapted Diabetes Prevention Program. They wanted them to receive something that might benefit them. So what we did is we took the Community Guide for, for Americans and we adapted that into a comparison intervention. And for those of you familiar with that guide, it, it covers everything that, related, that relates to the health of Americans. So cardiovascular disease, obesity, uh, violence, um, clean air, et cetera. So the comparison intervention received something that could benefit them but was very different from the goal-based diabetes prevention program. They received the same time, the same dose. So each received a session for one hour, once a week for 12 weeks, and once a month for six months. And we trained community health workers from both interventions uh, to deliver it. Now that was unusual because within the African American churches, they have health ministries. A lot of times those health ministries are registered nurses, farm Ds, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and some are lay workers. So what we did is we trained four individuals from each church 
to deliver the diabetes prevention program or the comparison intervention. We did all of our data collections at the church because that's what the community told us they wanted. That they did not want to come on campus and search for parking to provide their data. So we hired a local lab to draw our blood for A1C and fasting plasma glucose. We put an ad in the, the campus newspaper that we needed volunteers. So we had student volunteers, people from the president's office, people from all over campus that we trained to be our data collectors. So for each data collection time, we took about 20 people to each church to help collect these data. We also had ways to conference quality of life and a cost effectiveness measure. So at the end, we saw at 12 weeks, does this have a corner on it? We saw at 12 weeks, the, the blue line here at the bottom, that the intervention group lost 2.62 kilograms compared to 0 0.5 kilograms for the comparison. And then at 12 months, the intervention group had lost 2.39 kilograms, and the comparison group had started to trend upward, had gained 0 0.46 kilograms. Now that's significant for a community-based adaptation of a clinical program. The weight loss goal was 5 to 7 percent of their total body weight. And on average for the clinical trial, the average weight loss was about four kilograms. So we were very close. And we had over a 90% retention rate. So now we're into about 2014, 2015, for the first time ever, there was a recommendation for low-dose CAT scans for lung cancer screening. For those who are clinicians, you would know that that was the first time ever that we had a screening test for lung cancer. Generally speaking, we diagnose lung cancer incidentally. The patient comes in with a cough, hemoptysis, weight loss, and we diagnose stage four lung cancer. But this recommendation is that for individuals who are considered high risk, people who smoke a 30 pack a year history or have quit within the last 15 years, age 55 to 80, are considered high risk and should undergo once a year low dose CAT scans. Now the problem with this recommendation is although it's potentially life saving, to date only about two to four percent of individuals have undergone this screening. And there's a lot of reasons why not. Um, but what we found is that generally speaking, it's because of lack of awareness. If we ask people, what is the screening test for cervical cancer? What's the answer? What is it? Pap smears. What's the screening test for breast cancer? Mm -hmm. Colon cancer? If we had asked what is the screening test for lung cancer, would you guys have known? No. But even though you don't smoke, even though you are a male and you don't have a recommendations for mammography, you know what that screening test is. And we want lung cancer screening to have that same amount of awareness. So what we did is we started a a program that was funded by the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation. And what we wanted to do is increase awareness of cancer risk factors. With lung cancer that's unique, it's a social stigma related to lung cancer. There are some people that believe that people with a lung cancer diagnosis deserve to have lung cancer. So we wanted to present lung cancer screening within the context of any other screening test. So we taught them about all screening tests, and then we introduced this new cancer screening test. 
And then we wanted to increase their knowledge of cancer prevention and just early detection behaviors in general. We use the health belief model to guide the development of the intervention as well as our data collection survey. So for those of you familiar with the model, you know that it believes that age, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic, and knowledge modify behaviors and that what a person believes as what they're susceptible to or at a threat of getting if they have perceived barriers to undergoing a certain action, if they believe they can undergo it, or if there's a benefit to their undergoing a screening test or behavior, then they're more likely to adopt it. So we had a multi-component intervention that included four sessions that were taught by community health workers who were within seven churches, three federally qualified clinics and one community recreation center. They taught those four sessions over four consecutive weeks. We had a community resource manual because what we know from working with this population is that there are free resources or low cost resources available in the community, but oftentimes they're unaware of those. And then we had a care navigator we work with the lung cancer screening nurse of our, lung, of our cancer center, as well as our community health workers, and we train them to navigate those interventions of those participants to the lung cancer screening program, or to me, my practice was at the tobacco cessation clinic at the cancer center. And then we had community outreach, where we trained the community health workers to just go out in their communities and just <laughs> disseminate a pamphlet about lung cancer screening. And every site had to implement a policy change to make that site, be it a church or a clinic or a rec center, a tobacco-free campus. And we trained the community health workers in how to implement a policy change. And as I said, we navigated them to our cancer center, which at that time was offering free lung cancer screening. Because the health belief model has intent as an outcome, um, as scientists, we don't really want to measure intent. We want to measure outcomes. So at three months, we called all of the individuals who were identified as high risk for lung cancer, who met the screening criteria to determine if they had been screened or not, or if they had decided to undergo tobacco cessation treatment. We collected all of our data with the SNAP survey, which is an electronic survey, and we looked at their knowledge, their attitudes, because what we know about working with this population is that a lot of times their attitudes drives their behaviors. So if they believe that lung cancer screening is of no benefit, that lung cancer screening, that a lung cancer diagnosis is a death sentence, and that chemotherapy, radiation, or immunotherapy will make no difference, then they are unlikely to undergo a screening. We also know that they have beliefs that are unlike the beliefs of clinicians. For instance, if a person has cancer and they go to the operating room and they open them up, what happens when the air hits that cancer? Say it loud. It spreads. Yeah, it just goes everywhere. So they have these beliefs that we included in the intervention to help change their, to provide them knowledge about what the, the truth of those myths were. So we had 481 participants. The average age was 58. 92% of them were African Americans. Most were females, which is very common in community-based trials. And 16% were tobacco users, which is pretty close to the national average. For the health belief models, the severity of lung cancer um, statistically changed. And we believe that that is because we talked to them about all of the different treatments for lung cancer and about the benefit of early detection. 
the benefits of screening thankfully um, <laughs> change post-intervention and their perceived barriers about accessing lung cancer screening changed and their self-efficacy to undergo screening. And again, we see that intent was not statistically significant, but know that all of our 481 were not tobacco users. So therefore, a non-smoker would not have an intent. So we did do a sub-analysis of the tobacco users and found that there was a, a change in their intent among those individuals that did use tobacco. So then we looked at their knowledge about lung cancer screening. And as we had <laughs> hypothesized, 25% of them had no clue what the lung cancer screening test was. But post-intervention, 80% did. The harmfulness of e-cigarettes, most believed that there was zero harm in e-cig use, that it was just, that it was safer than tobacco or cigarette smoking. But post-intervention, that did change. The effects of nicotine, most believed that Nicotine caused cancer. They did not understand that nicotine was the addictive substance in the cigarette. And the signs of lung cancer and the cancer risk factors also changed. And then their attitude about clinical trial participation. In the last session, we talked about how people of color oftentimes are less likely to participate in clinical trials and how important that was that they participate. And there was a, a, a difference post-intervention in their likelihood of participating if uh, offered a clinical trial participation. And then their beliefs, that question uh, was related to the myths related to cancer detection and what happens when a person undergoes surgery for cancer. Behavior change um, from the intervention, uh, 125 of them agreed for low dose CTs, and the utilization of tobacco cessation services increased by 123%. However, I was very disappointed that 62%, although 125 did, 62% of those who were eligible for lung cancer screening um, did not undergo the screening. Now remember I said that we had a community health worker from their site that would call and speak to the lung cancer nurse who would schedule them immediately and the screening test was free. So this study was one of the first looking at community-based awareness of lung cancer screening but since we've learned that the same stigma associated with lung cancer is also a barrier to lung cancer screening uptake. So then I moved to Kentucky and we wanted to disseminate the lung cancer screening program to Kentucky. So why Kentucky, you guys know lung cancer is deadly as we know that Kentucky's number one, we know we have the second highest, and there are racial ethnic differences in cancer rates in Kentucky. We know that black males have higher cancer incidence as well as mortality compared to white males. And we know that within the state of Kentucky that there are some lung cancer disparities. And cancer screenings in general whether it's cervical cancer screening, colon or mammography, we know that those individuals who are most at risk are slower to adopt the new screening recommendations. So when we look at Kentucky, uh, black people in Kentucky compared to blacks across the nation, we see that Kentucky is a red state, that they have higher incidence of cancer. When we look at blacks, of both sexes related to lung cancer, we see that Kentucky is still a red state. And then we look at black males um, in general, we see that Kentucky <coughs> remains a red state. So then we get down to the county level. We see that black males in Davis's County here 
which is Owensboro, have a higher lung cancer incidence than white males. So that's why we went to Owensboro. So for those of you who know the state of Kentucky, you know that the western part of the state has more racial ethnic diversity than central Kentucky and eastern Kentucky. Some parts of western Kentucky has African American population as high as 27% within that county. We know that black males have lung cancer disparity, and we know that Markey Cancer Center has affiliate network, and Owensboro Health was one of the newer members of the network. And Orangeboro Health has a state-of-the-art lung cancer screening program. In fact, it's a center of excellence, and they have a community outreach director, and they're very engaged in that community. So we decided to disseminate the seed care from Georgia to Western Kentucky. But Western Kentucky is different from Eastern Kentucky in that they are unfamiliar with the community health worker model. So we wanted to examine the processes that were necessary to implement this lung cancer screening program in Western Kentucky through these community health workers. We met with the community through our community advisory board here and the recommendation was for it to be a one session intervention. So we took that multi-component intervention from Georgia that included all cancers and we condensed it to a one session intervention that focused only on lung cancer. So awareness of cancer risk factors, early detection, and knowledge of the lung cancer screening program. And because of what we had learned in the literature about lung cancer screening social stigma, we added lung cancer social stigma to the intervention. It started with community engagement. We met with Owensboro Health and some other individuals with, within Owensboro and really talked about which sites in Owensboro we should focus on. So we wanted to con recruit community health workers and in order to do so, we took a two-tiered approach. So what we did is we just advertise a one-day community health worker training. Our goal was to try to get 25 attendees to this training, and we wanted those individuals to be lay health people who had no health background, and <coughs> after they attended the training that basically taught them what a community health worker was, we recruited 10 of them to undergo training specific for the intervention. After the training, those community health workers would recruit 10 individuals from their site, teach one class, collect the data, and conduct outreach. In order for the participants to be enrolled, they had to be between the ages of 21 and 80, racial ethnic minority or medically underserved, and able to read English. And the results of that project that we just finished is that 90% were female and the average age was 44.6. Uh, now I'm wearing my CTSA hat and you'll notice that we measured sex as well as gender because what we're trying to do is we know that there are health disparities related to the LGBT community, but a lot of the scientists, we're only measuring male and female. So we really want our scientific community here at UK to measure sexual and gender minorities. 61% of our participants were white and 17% were black, 22% were Hispanic. And this is just our community health workers. <laughs> and 11% had high school education. The training focused on the role of the community health worker, how to <coughs> communicate with participants, the responsible research conduct, public health, what health disparities were, how to conduct community outreach, how to present in a culturally competent way, and then we assess their satisfaction with the training. And as you can see, uh, post-intervention, 
there were significant changes in all components of the training. And of note is that they really did not have an understanding of what the community health worker role entailed. So then we had the tier two training that was specific to delivering the K care intervention. We taught them how to deliver the session. We developed it with a script, what cancer risk factors were, the lung cancer risk factors, specifically what the lung cancer screening criteria were. They had to conduct informed consent, so we had to train them on how to conduct informed consent, how to collect the data, and how to recruit. It's very important that community health workers know how to recruit because they have that relationship with the population, which could be perceived as overly influencing. So we wanted them to be very clear on how they recruited, that they were really explaining the project in a way to help the individual make an informed decision as to whether they would attend or not. And then we had confidence questions, their ability to lead group, how to explain the screening criteria. Could they identify who was the screening candidate? And again, their satisfaction. And as you can see, they were all significant post-intervention. And then they recruited 10 individuals from within the site. We ended up with seven community health workers. The participants were age 42 to 44. Most were female. Most were white, with 21% being Hispanic. And most were high school graduates, and they were low social economic status, less than 25,000 a year. Compared to Georgia, 35% of the Kentuckians were smokers, compared to 16% for Georgia, 14% were former, and surprisingly, 27% were exposed to secondhand smoke on a daily basis. They were sedentary and they had low fruit and vegetable intake. Almost half had a history of, of cancer in their family and 20% had a family history of lung cancer. And 8% had a personal cancer history. Only 9% had been screened for lung cancer. Their knowledge post intervention of the lung cancer screening test increased. The nicotine effects knowledge <coughs> and the cancer risk factors. Of interest, they could, although they knew what the screening test was, we had a scenario of three individuals and they were to select the individual who should be screened and they were unable to do so. The social stigma subscale, the severity of lung cancer was the only significant uh, post-intervention change and that's related to the severity of lung cancer on an individual, how it would affect them after the diagnosis. And their total score for a significant change in their uh, thoughts about the stigma related to lung cancer, although not depicted on the slide, did change post-intervention. As far as the health belief model subscales, the benefits of lung cancer screening did change significantly. and their community outreach. Uh, through the outreach, they reached over 1,200 individuals. So in summary, community and academic partnerships definitely is able to help us reach diverse populations. The retention rates of all of these projects were close to 90%. We built the community capacity with the community health workers and their knowledge regarding the community health worker role. They were able to implement policy change, improve health outcomes, and change attitudes and beliefs, uh, which led to change in health behaviors. Although CBPR does have those strengths, there are some challenges, and just a few of them it relates to the time investment. Because being new to an institution with a community where it had taken years to establish the trust and relationship with them, 
to have to, to move and then build those relationships again. It takes an associate dean for research, a dean as well as the chair, to understand that you're not going to hit the ground running when you start a new CDPR in a new location. You have to take time to develop the trust of that community, and a lot of that trust comes from serving them. So not just showing up when you're ready to do your project, but to be able to come to their health fairs and speak at no cost, or to send your students over to help them with the health fair. And being consistent in spending time with them, reaching out to them for their anniversaries, their birthday, the holidays, et cetera, to let them know that you're still thinking of them even though you don't have an active project going. President Roosevelt said that nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care about them. And the community is able to pick that up very quickly from how you interface with them. Again, we have to serve them and not just get the data and leave. And in order to do so, it takes a tremendous amount of time, consistency, and it ends up with their having a trust relationship with you and a willingness to help you with your science. And I'll end by saying what David Satcher said at Morehouse, that in order for us to eliminate health disparities, we need leaders who care enough, know enough, will do enough, and who are persistent enough. Thank you for listening.